last Wednesday, I just started uh, sharing a little bit about uh, this mission trip just because I could not talk about it, and, you know, you're here, and so I'm going to talk about it. Um, and But I knew that we can, like, back-to-back weeks probably wouldn't be exactly the same crowd. So just briefly, uh, where we went and what we did, this is uh, a mission partner. I still didn't look up a picture of the Watsons. I should have done that. Um, why is this not working, Aaron? You know, I never had any problems until that week I asked Aaron to come lead this. There we go. Uh, this is that little red dot is where a town called Halitla, Mexico, is, and that's where a family, uh, the Watson family, they're based out of Halitla, and so it's in the up in the mountains, about four hours from one airport and three hours from another, and so we landed in San Luis Potosi, four hours away, on a Monday. I uh, drove there Tuesday, got all organized for our trip, and then uh, Wednesday went on this little route. If you can see those lines, this is me just drawing on my iPad, <laughs> basically what we did. The blue was by car, the red was on foot, uh, so it was like a Wednesday through Saturday, so four-day trip, um, and what we were doing is we're, this is, this is the list of uh, the Watsons have 38 different uh, little villages, like little works that they are, uh, areas they're working in. Uh, so some of them are full-fledged churches with, uh, you know, one pastor that his, this is, you know, their church. Other of them, uh, they've got a few guys that are kind of serving four or five different areas. And so the Watsons' main ministry is helping raise up these local pastors and disciple them and spread their work throughout these rural parts of the mountains in Mexico. Yes, sir. So they're from Alabama. Uh, they grew up in the northern part of Alabama between Huntsville and Birmingham area. Yeah, uh, the, so the Brandon and Heather Watson got married and then like within a year moved to Mexico 22 years ago, I think it was, 21, 22 years ago. They now have three children. Christina is about to turn 20 and starting community college in the fall. Joshua is eight, 16, 16. No, maybe he's a little older. He's about to get his license, so maybe he's 17. Anyway, uh, and then AJ is 10. So they have three kids. All of them were born after they moved to Mexico. And um, so they've been doing... Missions, mission work in Mexico for 20-something years now. Yep, yep. We went to visit the, the missionary friends of ours there. And um, so, yeah, so we've kind of got a growing partnership with them to support their ministry and their work. And uh, so our role for Alex, myself, and then one other guy, Ross Estep, is a pastor at Pickens. Our role is to go with these guys as they visited different places uh, and just be an encouragement to preach as we went. And then uh, one night we had, the one big thing we had prepared was this Bible study. They're going through this um, study kind of over time uh, that's put up by John MacArthur, but it's also in Spanish, uh, called Foundations of the Faith. It's about thir- 12 or 13 chapters of kind of fundamental type stuff. So my, my topic was salvation, uh, Alex's topic was the person and work of the Holy Spirit, and Ross was on Ross's lesson was on prayer. So that was our biggest night. It was like a three plus hour Bible study on Friday night that week. Um, so yeah, so basically each we kind of we made fifteen different stops. I think I counted visiting everybody from just like one little family to a church, and kind of sharing as we went and uh, preaching as we went, and that that original picture wasn't everybody. We didn't take very many great pictures, but this is three quarters of our group. Um, so the Watsons aren't here. Ross aren't, isn't here, but we just didn't take great pictures. So you got this one picture. Anyway, so this was. these are all either pastors or a couple of these guys are just friends that kind of went along with us to help out, um, some of the younger guys. And uh, so they, they all pastor churches and work in these different communities. And they're all from these parts. And uh, 
So it's just cool to see them, their work and to participate and help out uh, in some of the work they did. So what I started last week was I just wanted to share, um, you know, some biblical lessons I'm learning and relearning uh, by going there. So the ones, I shared three of them last week, that God calls us to missions in obedience to the Great Commission. That we're supposed to be sharing the gospel to all nations. And so I was reminded of that. Uh, I talked last week about discipleship happens when we walk through life together and teach the word, teach each other the word. Uh, last week I talked about how our presence is often a powerful ministry in itself. Uh, just seeing these, how, de- like some of these communities you can only get to by hiking. And these guys go there at least every two weeks to help minister to them and encourage them. And so it's two hours one way hiking and two hours back. If I have to drive to Malden, I get kind of like, man, I got to go all the way to Malden? Ugh, you know? So anyway, uh, so this is where I want to, this was one I didn't get to last week and uh, where I want to hang out for a minute, uh, is that grace-filled people are sacrificial givers. Grace-filled people are sacrificial givers. Um, so ha- have any of y'all spent some time um, in, they call it, uh, do I have a typo? Sacrificial. Sacrificial. That's not Espanol. Sacrif- There's no telling. Yeah. Good. Thanks for making me feel better. Thanks. Um, uh, Developing countries or third world countries. Does anybody spend any time outside the United States in places that are financially not quite as developed as our country? Chris has been spent some time in Haiti, I know. Amber spent some time in Nicaragua and Venezuela and Mexico, Brazil, Ecuador. Yeah, yeah, yeah. L- let me ask you this. What's your... Um, what was your experience like when you when you saw poverty? I just kind of, I mean, I know we have poverty here, um, and I guess depending on your exposure to poverty here, um, it may or may not be as you know surprising to you in other places. But what's your reaction, kind of when you see when you see poverty? You know, some people kind of have some kind of culture shock of you know trying to just deal with that. When you relate to people in poverty. What was what were some of your experiences with just what that's like seeing that kind of world? Yeah. Yeah, comparatively there's there's options usually here. Yeah. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm about to tell you about, because they blew me away, blew me away. That's exactly what I was getting at. So I, 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 we didn't, you know, you don't walk into somebody's home and snap a bunch of pictures. So I don't really have any pictures to show you uh, much of what it was like. This is about, you know, these are not great pictures, but I mean, you can tell most of these houses were things like this of just kind of, you know, wood, wood and concrete kind of thrown together. Usually, um, you know, some kind of version of that, and. Um, to, to Henry's point, is what Amber's saying. Like, I think many times when you step, you know, out of our just our context of seeing people and driving their own cars and you know coming to nice air conditioned buildings and you know you step into this world, there can be the, kind of a little bit of a jarring. Like, you know, you guys have nothing. You know, I, I want to take care of you, um, and it can be, yeah, there just can be some some jarring and. And I don't want to downplay, in this I'm not trying to downplay uh, the important, like it is better and we should be working to make sure everybody has access to clean drinking water. <laughs> like millions of people die every year from preventable diseases just because they don't have access to clean water, basic health care needs, vaccines, uh, sanitation like l latrine, some, some sanitary form of using the restroom. So those are important. We should be, we should absolutely, uh, as a world, be working to achieve those things. But at the same time, if we see ourselves as just because we have, you know, access to those things, if we put ourselves on a platform and say, oh, let me, let me come and help you, then we're, we may be missing something. And what I saw was, man, how much faith a lot of these people have. Uh, so we'd, I'm not going to camp out here long, but this is, this was adapted from one place. I found this in, um, uh, when Helping Hurts by, I can't remember the author's name, Brian something. Uh, but he adapted it from Walking with the Poor. He, he points out, like in Genesis 3, when, when, we, when sin came into the world and when we sinned, we broke, we brought poverty to every relationship that we have. One of those is to the material world, to, to, cre to creation. And so our work was cursed. And there is a, a material poverty that we have. But that's just one kind of poverty. We have a poverty in our relationship with God. There's a brokenness in our relationship with God. There's a poverty in the way that we view ourselves. Either we elevate ourselves and think we're somebody, or we are, uh, what is it called, so, like we have low self-esteem. Uh, there's poverty in the way we relate to other people and to community. You know? So uh, that is to say just that we may not have a material poverty uh, to the same level. I mean, we may certainly... There's all kinds of poverty uh, in the United States. But we may not have the same kind of poverty that some of the people that I saw have, but we probably have had a different form of poverty in a, in a different time. It's just different. It's not the same kind. Um, and what I was blown away by was the generosity of the people that we saw. So in all 15 of those spots that we visited, basically, I, I guess all 15. Yeah, probably. Uh, everybody gave me something. <laughs> Everybody gave me something, usually food or coffee or both. And one place we stayed, I mean, just that was the place that I had to hike to. We spent the night there. They fed us two meals and about 18 cups of coffee. <laughs> okay, like five, but a lot, you know, and there was a group of 20 of us, you know. And, um, and some of these places, you know, we had arranged for them to come, and, and our group left behind an, an offering, you know, to offset those costs, you know. So we're not like you know a burden to most of these people but um some of them we didn't like it just it wasn't appropriate like they they wanted to give us something and if we'd have handed them oh thanks for that we're not buying a meal you don't just hand somebody money they're being generous and uh two times the genera the generosity i mean i experienced it for four days of just i just every time I was blown away by the generosity but two times it brought me to tears um i don't have pictures of those moments but i'm just gonna show you those people you don't pull out your camera in these things, you know. But this guy, his name is Obispo, and uh, uh, played the violin everywhere he went. He's over 70 and was leading the way on the trails because he spent his whole life on these trails. So we, most of the time, I never saw him on the hike because he was too far ahead of me. But uh, the last morning, Saturday morning, we stopped by one of the pastor's houses. Uh, I don't have a picture of him, Joaquin. 
and uh, and uh, Obispo was a little bit bothered because he hadn't shaved in four days, and his hair, you know, his, his his goatee was getting a little long, and so he asked this guy because a lot of people, you know, sell little odds and ends out of their house, and this pastor has a little store, and he's like, hey, can I buy a, a razor? And he's like, oh, I'll go get you one. So he comes back, you know, with a, a basic disposable razor that we, I don't know what it would, I've never bought one single disposable razor. But even there, I'm thinking equivalent of 50 cents, you know, not a major item, even even by their standards, you know. Uh, you know, it's like one little cap. And he's like, great, how much is it, you know. And the other pastor says, no, man, it's a gift. It's, it's for you. And Obispo is just so moved by that. He said, well, we're going to pray then. And he stops, he prays, and he is calling down the blessing of God on this man's house. I mean, and he is just like pouring out his heart, thanking God for the generosity of this pastor and thanking God for his family and thanking, please, God, bless this man for his love and for his pure heart and his love for you. It was a disposable razor. And I'm just sitting there in my chair with a cup of coffee, just like, just can't hold it together. I mean, this guy genuinely loved it. It was incredible. Uh, Another one that just got me. Um, so I showed you uh, a video last week. This is the guy that speaks Huasteco, uh, Benigno. He speaks Huasteco and Spanish. And um, he, on the day we hiked, the day we started our hike, he came and met up with us. He went up with us to that point. And he had to leave his house at some crazy time. He, he hiked for five hours the way we were going. He hiked it in reverse to come meet up with us, to be with us on the hike that then took us two more days to go back to where he started. And he's got a little drawstring bag and like, you know, really simple shoes and that shirt, you know, just hiking along the mountain. He'd been hiking for five hours when we started. Okay, so we hike up, spend the night. Oh, that's what we hike up the first place. He, he preached that night, uh, hiked the next day, and, and then the next morning started hiking and got to his house <laughs> where he started. And when we got to his house, uh, of, of the places we visited, it was one of the poorer homes, just by the way, you know, it's structured. And so we came just to visit, encourage his family, prayed over him and his kids. And then his wife said, y'all, y'all come in. She didn't say y'all, you know, but you know, she invited us in. And, um, and she brought out uh, tamales. And the way they do these are they're wrapped in banana leaves or uh, corn husk. And it's this corn mixture with um, like chicken sometimes and beans sometimes. Anyway, there was... That, that was a, the, the group shot of like 20 of us, or 18 of us at that point. Some, not everybody was there, but, you know, this big, huge plate of tamales. And I'm just looking at around at her home and saying, this cost you something. You know, I mean, just to lay it all there and to bring coffee for everybody. And, um, and you know, a few of the places, and, I, you know, I'm still I'm trying to figure out the when it's appropriate. And so I, I got Valentin as one of the pastors. It's kind of one of the leaders of the pastors. And so I kind of pulled him aside, hey, can we leave an offering here? He's like, no, this is, you know, this is one of the times this is a gift. And if we try to give money, it would be paying for food. And so this is not a time. And so we didn't. They just generously gave. I, I don't know what it's tomorrow. I don't know what it costs to make that. I have no idea. But it was just incredibly generous. And so I'm walking away with Valentin, talking to him about this. Like, that, I'm, I'm just, I was just honest with him. I was like, man, that was incredibly moving. It was so generous. I was like, I you know, in my simple Spanish, I'm like, man, this is, I, I, I know plenty of, plenty of us have a lot more and give a lot less. And he said, it's like the, he said, it's like the widow's offering, isn't it? So Matthew, Mark chapter 12 says this, uh, Jesus, he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. And many people, many rich people put in large sums and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which made a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said, Truly I said to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had to live on. And, um, yeah, I just saw it in action. Somebody giving everything. I mean, you know, just proportionally just was blown away. And he just, he loved the ministry that he was doing. In his community, so he's the, the, the pastor for that community, there was one other believing family in this community. One other believing family. And he's doing everything he can to, to reach this community for the gospel. And he walks a long way to be able to go and 
minister, like to coordinate with other pastors and, and uh, trying to reach his, fam- reach his area and uh, just incredibly generous. Uh, and I just was so moved by that and thinking about how we, we measure in the total amount, right? Like a $1,000 gift is better than a $100 gift, right? And Jesus just doesn't measure that way. He doesn't measure that way. He measures in our hearts. He measures in, in where, where our heart is. And, um, and there's just example after example in the Bible that God just doesn't count things the way we do. And the, the all-in heart is what, is what God is so, uh, what, what he's asking of us and what, what, he, what Christians have. Um, so just like for her, it says, Jesus said, out of her poverty, um, she has put in everything she had. That shows up in 2 Corinthians 18, the Macedonian churches. Um, it says, uh, so, sorry, 2 Corinthians 8. Uh, for they gave according to their means, and as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. You know, so they're just giving beyond what they, what they oh, it says, uh, for in a severe test of affliction, uh, oh, I've got this on the screen, but a uh, severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Verse 2. So poverty was one of the things that led to their joy and generosity in giving. Uh, just incredible. Uh, we talked a few weeks ago about the rich young ruler. Jesus said, go and sell everything you have. Uh, and give to the poor and come and follow me. Um, second Corinthians, the, later on this chapter, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, where's the, what's the motivation for this? Uh, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Um, so over and over, I've, I've got a bunch of verses on my phone. Uh, I've got the same copy and paste ty- typo on this slide too. So, Yeah, graceful people are sacrificial, sacrificial givers. Uh, I think when the gospel has truly changed our hearts and we've experienced grace, it, it leads us to then show grace to others. And that's what we see over and over again in the Bible. Um, all right, I'm not going to stretch this to next week, so I'm just going to give you these quickly. Uh, in the gospel, there is a supernatural unity in our diversity. Uh, so when you saw that picture, it probably looked like there was two white guys and a bunch of Mexican guys. But those guys are actually from all different places. So the town we went, we started in was Halitla. Uh, and that's in the town of, in the state of San Luis Potosi. So we left that state. And this, sound, this sign says, Bienvenidos a Querétaro, a different state. Uh, but this group uh, represented three different states within Mexico. And some of those guys, like the older guy, Obispo, he lives in a different state, Hidalgo, and, uh, do, and he's, he's now, he's, he speaks Nahuatl in Spanish. Some of these other guys speak Huasteco in Spanish. And so between the group of us, we had uh, four different languages, English, Spanish, Huasteco, Nahuatl. Uh, we had, um, yeah, three different s- Spanish states, two different states in the United States, between you know, Alabama and South Carolina. Um, we had, uh, oh, and we had uh, three different college football teams, South, four different, South Carolina, Clemson, Auburn, and Alabama, uh, all on this thing. And so if, if God can bring together those kind of people for the same mission, uh, there's something powerful there. Uh, so Philippians 1, uh, 3 to 5, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you all, always in my prayer, uh, in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. When God brings together people for the sake of the gospel, he can cross whatever border, whatever line, whatever division, because we're, we're on the same team. Um, Galatians 3, 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. We've been unified by the gospel. Um, and that's where we're going, Revelation 7, 9. Um, all right, two more in two minutes. Uh, spiritual friendships are a gift from God. Uh, so I don't know if you've always grown up in the same place, always had the same group of friends, or your friends have changed. I have moved since college, since, since I left home. I've moved every four years, you know, basically. And, and uh, friends come and go. And I'll tell you, I will not take good friends for granted, good friends are worth a lot. They're worth a lot. Yeah. 
um, John 15, this comes from Jesus. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all that I have heard from you, my Father, I have made known to you. So he calls us friends. And Jesus says this about us. We're more than just friends. We are family. We're brothers and sisters. Uh, Jesus said, who are my brother and my brothers? And looking around at those who sat around him, he said, here are my brother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and mother. So it's hard to get much closer than hiking up and down mountains for four days and smelling each other's stank for four days. Uh, but I was grateful, grateful for Alex. And uh, <clears throat> probably, yeah, a little bit. That's all. That's all I can do is a stubble. That's all. I, that's all I can do. All right, last one. I love and appreciate my family. I remember that when I'm away. See this moment coming back to the. To the airport, it's pretty special. Uh, Psalm 127, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of a womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver. It's got a very full quiver, a very full car, very full house. It's full. I'm proud of that. I'm grateful for it, even when it costs me sleep. And I'm grateful for my wife, and I'm want to do a better job of loving her like the church, like Christ loves the church. So there you go. There's seven biblical lessons from the mission field uh, that I got from my time away. I was going to give some more time for questions, but we're kind of close to the end. Any, you guys got any questions about the Mexico mission partner or that kind of thing? And if they're bigger questions than I can answer right now, it's okay. I can get back to you later. But if you guys had to hike for four days. Yeah. We didn't totally have to, as my wife knows very well. There's one community we definitely could only get to by hiking. But one of the main reasons we did it by hiking is that's how these guys do ministry. And so we spent four days kind of living life the way they live it. And um, so there's a couple places. One, you can't get to another way. Others that if you, you'd have to have an off-road vehicle, like a four-wheeler or something, to get there. But we hiked for four days to connect these different communities that they're doing ministry in. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's not a filter. Is it the one where the guy's preaching? Yeah. yeah. So they have, they do have uh, running water. I don't, I don't have a way to go mask backwards. That, yeah, they need help with the runoff. but it's both. So they capture the rainwater and they have uh, a pipe there that brings water. But so a lot of Nicaragua's this way. Uh, that it's not the water's not on 100 percent of the time. So what it is is the, when the water's on, it fills up this tank, and or you know as much as they get for the day. And so it's just a way of storing it because you can't always go to the faucet and turn it on. You turn it on out of the tank, and because water is not a guarantee then they also make sure they catch rainwater to keep. So it does, it gets supplied by the rain and supplied by a, a pipe, but it, you definitely have to conserve. It's not like use whatever water you want. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they do these tanks, like Halitla is a, you know, kind of middle-class city, so to speak, and everybody has a tank because it's just, just the way it works. So, so. we saw, uh, a couple like horses on these trails hiking and bringing helping bring in these like massive tanks you know to people because everybody home needs one you know and, or wants one at least so yeah yeah all right well this um we hope to keep going back to visit and help out where we can and um so there may be opportunities this is where the joy boxes goes to this ministry so every Christmas or November, we pull together joy boxes and uh, the Watsons do a big children's ministry to support these churches. And one of the things they'll do, you know, January or so is do a big event where they give out boxes. And so usually every year, there's a few people from our church that go and help with those events because those take a lot of extra hands and you get to see. That's a real fun, fun way to see the ministry in action. All right, let me pray for us. God, I thank you for tonight. Thank you for what you teach us. 
Thank you for your word. Thank you for generous people and uh, the impact they have on us. God, we pray that you would bless uh, this group here, bless uh, that group in Mexico, those pastors, the Watson family as they continue to serve. And uh, we just pray that you'll lead us and direct us and keep us close to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. Thanks for being here.